Hello, everyone. It's my pleasure to uh, share my presentation on the pharmacology of SARS-CoV-2 antiviral drugs. Unfortunately, I cannot be with you today in person, but I hope I will be able to join you later on during the Q&A session online. So here you see my disclosures. And this is the content of my presentation for today. I will briefly summarize the antiviral drugs that we have for SARS-CoV-2 momently. The main part of my presentation today will be on the risk of drug-drug interactions with pneumotrophia ritonavir, also named Paxlovid. That will be a summary. Uh, I will discuss with you the management of the drug-drug interactions in COVID-19 patients, and especially the practice guideline, and share some clinical experience we have in this drug-drug interaction management with nematrophia. And I will end with conclusions. But before we go to talk about nematrophia and the drug interactions, uh, just one slide on one of the other drugs, monupiravir, which is a SARS-CoV-2 polymerase inhibitor. That mechanism of action of this agent is thought to be through the induction of mutations in viral genome. The dose is 800 milligrams BID for five days, so that's a total of 40 capsules. Modulpinavir is not metabolized in the liver, and there are no major drug drug interactions expected with this agent. The efficacy of monopiravir is questionable. There are some conflicting results, and there are also some concerns about the mutagenesis. And as a result of these two factors, uh, monopiravir is uh, hardly used anymore. It's either not available or uh, has limited use in some countries. I don't think it will be available in, in some yeah, momentarily. We now talk about nematrophia, uh, which is a SARS-CoV-2 protease inhibitor. Um, this agent has a very poor absorption on its own and it is rapidly metabolized by the liver. It has a very short half-life of only two hours. Therefore, nematerophia needs a booster, ritonavir, and that's how we call it nematerophia boosted by ritonavir, a trade name Paxlovid. The dose of nematerophia is 300 milligrams, which is two tablets of 150 milligram, with one tablet of the booster ritonavir, 100 milligram, twice daily. And these are also administered for five days, which gives you 30 tablets. It's not a co-formulation, but it's co-package. So that's separate tablets in one package. Very important to realize is that Vitonovin not only boosts the concentrations of nematrophia, but also potentially of other medications. And therefore, the management of drug-drug interactions is an essential part when using this agent. And Maybe some of you will think that drug-drug interactions is something dangerous and you don't want to talk about or think about. Uh, you want to avoid them, of course. But my opinion is that the drug-drug interactions are not dangerous. The only one that is dangerous is the one that is missed and all the others can be managed. And I will uh, explain to you what I mean with this statement. So the boosting of nematrophia by ritonavir is something that uh, we have seen before in other therapeutic areas. Uh, some of you will have some experience in treatment of HIV-infected patients, where, for instance, lopinavir or darunavir is also boosted by ritonavir. And also nematrimavir uh, makes use of the same principle. That effect of boosting is based on CYP3A inhibition, where nematrimavir is the substrate, the CYP3A substrate, and ritonavir is the booster, the CYP3A inhibitor. And this boosting is also called pharmacokinetic enhancement. And you can see from this publication that already more than 25 years ago this was discovered and is applied uh, already in millions of patients around the world. This figure shows you why we need a booster when we are administrating uh, neurotrophia. The dark line shows the plasma concentrations of neurotrophia when you give it as a single agent. And the uh, dotted line, the lowest dotted line, is the EC90 of SARS-CoV-2. So you want to be above that lower level. You can see that already very rapidly after intake, the concentrations of nematrophia drop below this level. So that means that it's no active anymore, or you have to give the drug every two hours, for instance. 
If you add ritonavir as a booster, you see much higher concentrations of nimetvelvir, which also prolong much longer. And you can see that you are at least 18 hours above this threshold. So therefore, it's possible to give this drug twice daily when you add this booster. So ritonavir can cause drug-drug interactions also with other medications. We call it a perpetrator. And the victims, they are the substrates uh, that are affected by ritonavir boosting. So that's very relevant, of course, if a patient is using other medications that are also CYP3A substrate, and especially when they have a narrow therapeutic range, because then you would expect the levels of these CYP3A substrates to go up and may cause toxicity. In the product label of Nimetvelvir, you can find a long list of agents that are indeed CYP3A substrate with a narrow therapeutic range. And some of them are really contraindicated, and then some others you need a dose adjustment. So it's very important to be aware of all the co-medications that a patient is using when you start a treatment with the Nimetvelvir boosted by Ritonavir. When you Add the uh, nimetvelvir ritonavir to the regimen of a patient. We have to realize that the CYP3A inhibition is really a direct effect. Uh, even if the course of the treatment is only five days for Paxlovid, the uh, effect can really be uh, very important because the maximal inhibition of CYP3A is already achieved within two days after starting the treatment. So it's really possible to get toxic levels of your co-medications during this course of uh, nematelvir. Another aspect that is important to realize is that the mechanism of this inhibition is actually inactivation. So the CYP3A is inactivated. And that means that when you stop with the treatment after these five days, then it still will be uh, present. The inhibition can still be present for another two or three days. This is the time period that is needed for the liver, for instance, to produce new CYP3A, which is not inactivated. Which means that you have to calculate the uh, effect of the CYP3A inhibition, not only the five days during the Paxlovid use, but another three days extra. So in total, eight days. And in some patients, it may even take a little bit longer than that. Which means that if you start treatment, let's say, on a Wednesday, then also you have to realize that the inhibition will be present at least to the Wednesday the, the week after. So in total, eight days. To make it even more complex, we're not talking only about CYP3A, because Ritonavir is also an inhibitor of other enzymes. So it's a weak inhibitor of CYP2D6. And that's an enzyme in the liver which is relevant for a number of uh, antipsychotics or antidepressants and antiarrhythmic agents. Furthermore, it's a mixed inhibitor, inducer of PGP, a membrane transporter, um, which means that it is possible that drugs that are substrate of this PGP transporter, the levels may go up and there are some data that it can be doubled uh, in case of a PGP substrate. So if you have a PGP substrate with a narrow tip to the range, then also levels may go up. So you have to be cautious when combining this with nematophia. Finally, it can also have the opposite effect. So no inhibition, but induction means the higher expression of certain other enzymes. However, such an effect only becomes more relevant later on with prolonged uh, treatment with nematophia. So normally we don't think this is a relevant interaction mechanism for the short course of nematophia of five days. So if we now have a little bit of the background, how these interactions may occur, how are we going to manage this? Well, the first step is very important and should be standard of care. You have to collect all the information of all the communications, also the herbals, uh, supplements that patients may not always see as a medication, you have to know what they are taking. Then the next step would be to go to one of the dedicated interaction websites. For instance, the University of Liverpool has developed an excellent interaction website that you can find here, where you can check whether one of the communications can be used with nematophilia, yes or no. Another step uh, might be that if that information is a little bit complicated uh, to read, that um, we are going to make for you a dedicated uh, 
translation of a Dutch website that we have developed last year. So there will be a Zambian translation as part of this project uh, being developed, uh, dedicated for the use of this agent in your country. And even in that situation, if you don't have enough information, we will make sure that you can reach an expert and have a dedicated question and get advice for treatment. So if we go into these steps a little bit more in detail. Um, this is a booklet that hopefully you all have on your desk now uh, that we produced based on the uh, Zambian National Formulary, where all the medications that are listed there have been checked, uh, mainly with the Liverpool database, and we have provided an advice whether these agents can be combined, yes or no, or whether dose modification is necessary. So I hope you find that booklet uh, useful and that you can use it in your clinical practice. Um, so if you go to the website and you want even check for more uh, drugs to, to be used or in combination with nematode here, you can see here uh, a screenshot of uh, an interaction that, that I checked for purpose of this presentation between nematode here and amyodarone. And you see clearly a red signal, do not go administer. This is really a combination that cannot be used. We should realize that by using these tools and also the booklets, does not mean that uh, the healthcare provider is no longer responsible. You always will be responsible yourself for the treatment of patients and the resources that we are providing to you and that I'm mentioning in this presentation are really only a supporting tool, but it's up to you to take a decision to combine yes or not. So Liverpool has, has uh, listed all these different medications and they have applied an algorithm and you can find more information on that in the publication. Um, and they checked every medication and gave it a color. So on the left side, you see that there is a large group of agents where no drug-drug interaction is expected. So that's easy. If you have a patient with that drug, you can just start with the nematrophy treatment if that's indicated. Then you see next to the green box, a uh, yellow box, that there could be some communications where there could be a minimal drug interaction, but actually it's not clinically relevant. So that's more or less the same as green. You can still start the treatment with nematode here in such a patient. Then on the uh, right part of the, of the figure, you can see uh, red boxes where it became more uh, problematic. So there can be some drug-drug interactions where you have to do extra monitoring or where there's a dose adjustment and you can still uh, start the treatment. Also very important to realize because this treatment is only for five days, some of the co-medications may be discontinued temporarily. So for instance, if you talk about a statin, patients are using a statin, you can stop the statin for five days. There are two reasons for that. The one reason is that uh, it will not hurt a patient if he's not taking the statin for a couple of days. And the second reason is that the concentrations of the statin that are present at the time you start with the nematophia, they will remain more or less during these five days of the course because the metabolism is inactivated. So even if the patient is not taking the statin, he's still being treated, exposed to the statin. Well, then finally, on the right part, there can be some agents that give very strong interactions that cannot be stopped and which really cannot be combined. So that could be some contraindications, but that's really a very small minority of all the communications. I will show that to you later on. So this could only be the situations where patients cannot be treated with Paxlovid. So I asked uh, my colleagues from the University of Liverpool who has developed this website about the queries that they received last year. And they gave me this list of the top 10 co-medications. And you can see quite a lot of drug names that may be familiar to you. I checked with these agents whether they are in the Zambia National Formulary, and at least four of them are. And maybe some of them are used even outside the formulary. They were also able to see that there were only 43 queries so far from Zambia uh, territory. Uh, but maybe that's, that's increasing when you get more access to this uh, medication. So I said that we in the Netherlands uh, developed uh, a tool which is uh, some kind of a translation of the Liverpool uh, website because we realized and had some experience that maybe some prescribers who have less experience in managing drug interactions 
um, finding information in Liverpool is sometimes a little bit complicated. And we were able to make some uh, very specific advices for our Dutch situation. So we developed a Dutch tool. And um, you can see in this uh, slide that it's a little bit more simple. You just type in the drug name and you directly get the intervention or the action or no interaction. And there's a separation of the drugs that, that give an interaction and drugs that give no interaction. So to make it a little bit more easier, uh, if people have less experience in using the Liverpool website, again, I should stress that the age healthcare provider is still responsible for making these decisions. And this tool is only a supporting tool. Well, you may think based on my presentation so far that really all medications can give drug interactions with the pneumotrophy, but it's definitely not the case. So this is a review that was published last year from the US where they looked at the top 100 most prescribed drugs in that country. And they found that uh, 70 out of these 100, so 70% of these medications were not susceptible to a drug interaction with pneumotrophy. So, Interactions are important, but definitely not for all of the medications. Uh, when I checked our Dutch uh, database, I come more or less to the same numbers. So 71% uh, does not have an interaction with nematrophia. So we are focusing on about 20 to 30% of the medications where it, in, where it is important to either dose modify extra monitoring or sometimes contraindicated. But you can see the true Contraindicated co medications where you cannot give the combination is only 7%. So it's not zero, but it's definitely a very small minority. And I also applied already these rules for the Zambian formulary, uh, and you can find it in, in the booklet that there will be many greens in, in the booklets. Patients can be treated, but even uh, more than 80% of the drugs that are found in your formulary. Of course, in some other aspects, you have to consult a specialist doctor what to do. Maybe you have to discontinue the communication for a couple of days or, and this is 6% only of the medications where the patients cannot be treated. So I've been telling you that the nematrophia and the booster, they cause drug interactions, so they are the perpetrator. But uh, to be complete, uh, there can also be a risk that this agent is a victim of a DDI, so that other medications may cause an interaction affecting the concentrations of nematrophia. And that is largely um, restricted to the strong CYP3A inducers. So important by Fempin, TB drug, or certain anti-epileptics, some drugs for prostate cancer if you have access to it, some John's word um, that maybe some patients may use. They are strong inducers. They can inactivate the booster. So there's no boosting anymore and the nematrophy concentrations are not high enough. So that's uh, something uh, you have to realize that that can be a reason why the medication nematrophy cannot be used because patients are on TB treatment and cannot stop with that, of course. So I come to the conclusions of my patients. I hope I have made it clear to you that the DDI management is not difficult. We do have the knowledge how to use this drug uh, with co-medication, but it does require a proactive communication between you as prescribers or as pharmacists, the, all the healthcare professionals and the patient, of course, what to do. And I would like to end with the slide that I already showed to you. And now I hope you can understand and that you do agree with me. Drug drug interactions are not dangerous. The only dangerous drug interaction is the one that is missed but all of the others, they can be managed. Thank you very much for your attention.